the notes for today's message are on your phones uh, in the YouVersion Bible app. Matthew 26, we begin this new series over these next four weeks to Easter, taking the journey with Jesus to the cross. Part of the reason we're doing this is my fear is we know the story too well. My fear is that the story of Jesus' walk to the cross can become a bit ho-hum. But this story is a story that changes lives and hopefully is a story in these four weeks that if God, with God's help will be a story that will change our lives again. This is not a safe story. This is not a story you read and go, yeah, I get that, no worries. This is a story about how the whole of human history changed in a way that continues to ask questions of us today. So let's start with verse 1 of verse 26, of chapter 26 rather. And you'll notice Matthew has arranged his gospel very clearly with clear themes Uh, and one of the things he did is he put five blocks of Jesus teaching in starting with the Sermon on the Mount and last year we looked at the other four uh, in Matthew 10, 13, 18 and then chapters 23 to 26 and it's at the end of that teaching we finished looking at last year Jesus says Well, Matthew has, in verse 1, when Jesus had finished saying all these things. So, in Matthew, what's clear is Matthew is now going to change gears. So, the teaching phase is over and what Matthew has Jesus now saying, as you know, the Passover is is two days away and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. So Matthew is making it clear, from now on, that's, this is what the story's about. We're, we've finished the teaching phase, the demonstration phase, and now we are into the journey to the cross. And the fact that Passover is two days away means that Jesus is speaking on the Tuesday. And many of the significant moments happen on the Thursday night, which we'll, we'll begin looking at. Uh, today. Now, we see the chief priests were not so impressed by Jesus. Uh, The chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they schemed to arrest Jesus and secretly kill him, but not during the festival, they said, or there may be a riot among the people. The chief priests and the elders don't like the fact that Jesus has more influence than they do. They're losing authority. They're losing the respect of the people. And so they want to take, because they're saying the people's attention's on Jesus, we want it to be put back on us. Uh, and, And right up front, this bit of the story asks this question of us. Who's influencing you? Who's influencing you? And you'll find that's a question that comes right the way through. It can be tempting to want to fight for your own status, to want to fight for your own influence. But this story is a story of how God comes and brings his kingdom differently to how anybody expected it and so we come to this beautiful little story but challenging story in Bethany Uh, verse 6 while Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper now what that tells us is that uh, it's probably most probably a man who has been cured of leprosy because a leper would not have a home that you go and have a meal in 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 that time so so this is probably somebody Jesus has cured of leprosy and 
Jesus is among friends. He, where there are other stories where Jesus goes to Pharisees' houses and they try and trap him, but this isn't one of those moments. This is in Bethany, where his good friends lived, Mary and Martha and Lazarus, and uh, something happens. Someone we now know through the Gospel of John to be Mary of Bethany, I often get it confused with Mary Magdalene, there's a few Marys in the story, but Mary, who was the one that sat at Jesus' feet, brought to Jesus uh, this uh, container of perfume, which we know to be, thanks to John, nard, which you can still buy online, Uh, it's a bit cheaper than it was in those days, Uh, John 12 tells us, or we actually pick up that this was a, a year's, this is worth a year's wages, a year's wages. So, just to get a sum, this, this little jar of perfume is worth a year's wages. In Australia right now, the average wage, average annual wage is about $68,000. And so, Mary comes... And she doesn't hold anything back. She breaks this jar and uses the whole jar to anoint Jesus. She doesn't hold anything back. There is no indication that Mary is a a wealthy woman, but she's bringing her treasure, all that she has, to Jesus. And what are the disciples worried about? Look at the story. What what are the disciples worried about? What what, what was that? Waste. Waste. What a waste. It's interesting, this is the same Mary who was sitting at Jesus' feet and it looks like she picked up what was going on at at a level the other disciples didn't. Probably not fully, but she brings the whole gift of her perfume and the disciples are saying, yeah, but there's all these poor people. $68,000, that's a lot of pizzas we could have fed the hungry people with. And some people say, well, this is the reason why we don't have to worry about poverty. So they say, the poor you'll always have with you. Jesus is actually quoting Deuteronomy where it says, all, Deuteronomy 15, 11, there'll always be poor in the land, therefore I command you to be open-hearted toward your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. Uh, Jesus wasn't telling them not to worry about the poor, but he was saying that what Mary is doing is recognising what God is actually up to in this moment. This, this must have been a heavy, Jesus must have had a bit of a heavy heart as he was saying, this is actually the right response to this moment. It also reminds me, we, policies are important. We, we, as a church, I'm so grateful for the work we have on, we've done on policy, uh, where you, and a policy is a repeated answer to a repeated question. That's what a policy is. But you can't do life by policy. Because God is always doing a new thing. And so, while it is right for us to have a a, a real and active response to the poor or to the the sick, or what, what is fundamentally important is for you to be doing what Mary was doing, saying, Jesus, what do you want me to be doing in this moment? God, what are you up to in this moment? I had a, a friend who was a Catholic girl I worked with for a number of years and, and she would continually say to me, there's lots of good things you could be doing but there's only ever one God thing you can be doing. It's interesting, in the book of John, we also get this sense that Judas was a bit upset about how they spent the money, not because of the poor but because he was wanting to enrich himself. And, and again, there's this 
challenge. We're going to address it more in, in a couple of weeks. There's this challenge. It's, it's so easy to come to the moment and think, what can I get out of this? How do I make my life a bit better? How do I make my life a bit more comfortable? And it's in that context we get this sad little story. In verse 14, and, and most people who study Jesus' life agree that uh, the previous things happened on the Tuesday and this thing now, this is the only recorded thing that happens on the Wednesday of Easter. That G- Judas goes and offers to sell Jesus out. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. 30 pieces of silver is equivalent to about four months wages so so judas price to sell out jesus was seventeen thousand dollars in our in today's money in some ways the story before the story of mary breaking her jar asks the question what price would you be willing to pay to bless jesus what price would you be willing to pay? What of, your, what of yours would you be willing to lay at Jesus' feet to bless Jesus? The story of Judas asks a different question. What's your number? How much would you need in order to betray Jesus? How much stress would you need to be under? How much money would you need? What would you need to be promised in order to betray Jesus? Let's be honest. We're all in a day-by-day quest to, to follow Jesus as best we can. But isn't it true there are times where you take your eyes off him? Isn't it true as you get to the end of your life and you look back on your life, there will be days where you did sell out? where it may not have been 30 pieces of silver. It may have just been trying to keep the peace and avoid some conflict. It may have been fear and fear of a new thing, so no, I'll, and I'll avoid that fear. Or it may have been money. It may have been money. Judas' life asks an important question of us. And now, with that framework, Matthew leads us into Thursday evening. I won't get into the details of it, but in your sermon notes, I've actually listed all the different things that happen on Thursday evening, and this is a jam-packed evening. There's a... So many things that change the course of human history happen on this evening and there isn't one gospel that captures them all. It's, it's stunning, the significant moments that happen on this Thursday evening. They very clearly come to celebrate the Passover We're going to talk more about Passover, but Passover was this incredible moment in Jewish history that's captured in the book of Exodus, where the the Jewish people were under oppression and God rescues them. 
And they are to celebrate that on, a, on an annual basis ever since, remembering that they are God's special people and God rescued them. And they would retell the story of Passover. And what we're gonna, in a minute, we're going to uh, take some time to reflect and, and we'll sing a song, but then we're going to come back and, and take communion together and we'll let Jesus lead us in communion this morning as he led his disciples. But they come to this moment and, and I reckon we come to the most horrible moment of Jesus' life up to this point. Where he says, truly I tell you, in verse 21, one of you is going to betray me. It was really helpful the way Nick framed it. I, I don't know many people who get through life without feeling betrayed by somebody. And what Nick is saying is absolutely right. The, the, the normal worldly response to betrayal is to want to hit back, isn't it? That's the, the normal worldly response to betrayal, to want to hit back. And, and Jesus really could hit back pretty well if he wanted to, couldn't he? He just, he just had to say to one angel, get him. It'll be sorted. <laughs> Jesus doesn't, as Nick pointed out, respond that way. All the disciples were alarmed and it does indicate to you that they, they're still on a journey and they're not sure, oh, no, you know, would it be me? Surely you don't mean me, Lord. And in, in a matter of minutes, he'll be chatting to Peter. We'll talk more about that. Because while Peter may not have betrayed Jesus in the way Judas did, I think it'd certainly be true that what he did was, it could be called betrayal. We're going to talk about that the week after next. And Jesus replies, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. Uh, now, that's not some secret code. All the disciples, all the 12, have dip, dipped their hand in the bowl. What he's saying is, one of you, my close friends, one of you guys, you're going to betray me. It's one of the most difficult and painful things you can experience to have a close friend betray you. And if you've experienced that, I just want to say I'm sorry. Also important to understand you're not Robertson Crusoe. It is sadly part of the human experience. Because <coughs> we're all a bit broken. And so, Jesus says, we, we, I know this is what's been written, I know this is what's coming, and he, it clearly says the one, uh, the Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. And in that, he's most probably referring to Isaiah. And there's a quote there, one of the verses from Isaiah. It's very clear. Jesus, it's by his wounds we are healed. He was crushed for our iniquities. Isaiah was clear that somehow this servant was going to have to suffer for our redemption. Now, you'll notice Judas asks a different question of Jesus than the disciples, the other disciples asked. What, did you know, what do you notice about the difference between the, the question Judas asks and the question Jesus, Jesus, the other disciples asked Jesus? Have a look at the, the verse there. What, what's the difference between what Judas asks and what the other disciples ask? Yeah. What, the other disciples say... Surely you don't mean me, Lord. And Judas says, surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. 
What's the difference between Lord and a rabbi? Yeah, well, Lord is in charge. A rabbi is telling you some nice ideas that you can take or take or leave. And fundamentally, we come to this question at the heart of the gospel. Paul writes, if we confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord, not if we confess with our mouths that Jesus is rabbi. What does it mean for you in your life for Jesus to be Lord? For Jesus to actively and actually be in charge? And are there times where it's a bit easier to treat him as a rabbi? Where, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that bit but ignore that bit, thank you very much. Have you had the experience in your journey of, you know, kind of knowing Jesus is asking you to do something and working hard to avoid it. What I want to do now is just for a couple of minutes, the band's going to come up and lead us in a song. But I invite you, because I think this question, is Jesus Lord or Rabbi? Is the fundamental question of our faith. If you're brave enough, what I'd love you to do is turn to the people near you and, and have a chat about what's been your experience in this whole question of whether Jesus is Lord or Rabbi in your life. I know it's a, bit, it's a big question and, and, there, and just know as you, as you do this, here at Citywide we, there are no experts... <laughs> We're all on this journey together. None of us have all the answers apart from Jesus. But I do feel like this is an important question for us. So let's take a moment or two to just talk where you are. And if you're at home, if you're on a couch with a few people, I encourage you to, uh, to chat to the people you're on the couch with. But if you're there, just to take some time to reflect for you now, in this past week, has Jesus been Lord or has he been Rabbi? So let's have a chat about that and we'll come back after the band leads us this in. Please be seated. So we're going to now let Jesus lead us in communion with his words from Matthew 26. As we do, we'll do our best to understand what those words actually mean. So, if you're at home, I encourage you to find uh, a drink and, and, a, and a wafer or a bit of bread. Uh, and we want to explain and, and take this moment to, to explain what is going on here. Because I, I do fear... Because we do communion most weeks here at Citywide, the danger is it can, be, it can become regular. We can become inoculated to it. And we can miss the incredible symbolism, the incredible message behind communion. Now, you'll see in... Uh, as we, as we pick it up here in verse 26, while they were eating. So they were, they were is, is what it says. And, and so the, what they were eating was the Passover meal. At the heart of the Passover meal were three core things, three core items. There was a lamb, there was unleavened bread, and there was bitter herbs. And then there were at least... Uh, it depends at what point in Jewish history you pick it up. There were a number of glasses of wine as well. And each wine represented one of God's... Each cup of wine represented one of God's promises. 
And what Jesus does is he takes this Passover meal that is a symbol of salvation from oppression for God's specific people and he reinterprets the whole meal. But we need to understand the meal to understand how he's changed things. The first thing to understand is that Passover, whenever it was celebrated, it was always in community. You didn't have a private Passover meal. It was never a one-on-one kind of thing. Passover was always something you did in community. Exodus 12 says, if any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbour, having taken into account the number of people there are. You'll determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. We were in our teaching team, we were talking about this and Dan looked it up and and apparently a whole lamb feeds about 42 people. So one of the dangers we have in faith is over-personalisation. Paul, when he explains the communion meal, says... So then, my brothers and sisters, whenever you gather to eat, you should eat together. It's been beautiful through the pandemic and lockdown that we've been able to still share communion together. And in some senses, for those of you who are at home, you are together with us. But can I encourage you, for, and I love the fact that for those who are unwell or those who can't make it to church, having the online service is a gift. But let's just watch and make sure and keep each other accountable that we don't move to the kind of Christianity that is just about meeting my needs and, and, and about just over-personalisation. Because communion and the Passover initially and then communion was never meant to be like that. It was always meant to be something you did together with others. That's the first thing. The second thing uh, is that Jesus, instead of the lamb, Jesus chooses the bread. Now, the lamb was meant to be the symbol of God's sacrifice. But Jesus chooses that unleavened bread, this wafer that we will take together. He he chooses this to symbolise his body rather than the lamb. That's because lambs no no longer needed to be sacrificed. No more animals need die because the one lamb was given. The Apostle Paul writes, get rid of the old yeast so you might be a new unleavened batch as you really are because Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. As he comes to break bread with the the men and women there in the upper room, it must have been with a sense of weight. As he would be looking at the carcass, the, the, the bones left after people had feasted on the lamb and know that's going to be me. And he chooses unleavened bread. Now, there's a couple of other things that Jesus brings out in terms of unleavened bread and that are true that the, that the disciples would have known. One is that the unleavened bread, and it's important to think about this every Sunday as you come to take communion, it symbolised a, willing a willingness to let go of your security a willingness to let go of the things that make you feel comfortable. Exodus says, when the dough the Israelites had bought from Egypt, they baked loaves of unleavened bread. The dough was without yeast because they'd been driven out of Egypt and didn't have time to prepare food for themselves. This sense that the the dough is, the unleavened bread is, is a symbol that I always need to be ready to move when God tells me to move. 
I need to be ready to leave my comfort zone if God tells me to leave my comfort zone. The other thing that Jesus comes out with time and time again is the idea that yeast is a symbol of things being contaminated. And he, he says in Matthew 16, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He, in Mark, he says, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. And meanwhile, in, in Luke, he says, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees. And he gets specific about it, he says, which is hypocrisy. So, Jesus comes and he takes this little bit of bread and he says, take and eat. This is my body. That this is the, the moment that all the things that were sort of promised in the shape of that Passover lamb are now coming to fruition. In a minute I'm going to pray and we'll take this wafer that Jesus instructed us to take. But as we do remember, we are reminded by this sacrifice, by this bit of bread, that no more lambs have to die. Jesus' sacrifice was once and for all. It was done. We're also reminded that we need to watch for anything that wants to take our security and trust away from him. We're reminded that we come together in community and we are challenged to think about what influences, what yeast may have come into our lives in this last week that are trying to influence our faith. So let's pray. Jesus, there is so much behind your words, behind this simple little meal, as we come this morning. We just want to say thanks. Thank you. We don't understand what this cost you. But thank you for your grace, which is represented by this piece of bread. In your name. Amen. Let's eat together. Then Jesus took the cup, which didn't look anything like this cup. There were normally four cups of wine in a Passover se celebration. Uh, later on, they added a fifth, the cup for Elijah. Um, and it's most likely that the cup Jesus took was the third cup, which is called the cup of blessing or sometimes the cup of redemption. And it corresponds to God's third promise to the Jewish people, which was... I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. This is in Exodus 6.6. 6. I will free you from being slaves to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. Now, Jesus doesn't only take this cup and, and say that this promise that God made to the uh, Israelites is now fulfilled. He also says... This is my blood of the covenant. This is my blood of the new covenant, that which you've been waiting for. Ever since Jeremiah wrote, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and the people of Judah. No longer will they say, no longer will they teach their neighbour or say to one another, know the Lord, because they'll all know me from the least to the greatest. Or in Ezekiel where it says, I'm going to give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. A, in a contract, if you're talking about contracts, in a contract, both people sign it and then if one person breaks it, the other person is relieved of their responsibilities. But in a covenant, both people are always bound by the covenant no matter what the other person does. 
And so God makes a new covenant, a new way of relating. And this time, the covenant is not just limited to God's special people. It's open to all of us. Titus tells us, when the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared, he saved us. Not because of the righteous things we'd done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and by renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out generously through Jesus Christ our Saviour. So that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. What does the cup symbolise? It symbolises God's grace. You didn't earn this. You didn't work it up or work it out. His blood sets us free. And invites us to the incredible new life that he has for us. Let's drink together. I want to just point out that most of us usually, we, t- we tend to think communion finishes at that point. But Jesus goes on. And he says, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. There is this sense in which communion is a meal in three parts. The third part's yet to happen. That as we come to communion, we are reminded that, yep, life is difficult. And we are broken. And we need grace. But there's going to be a point at which this symbolic meal we experience week by week finds its fulfilment in the third cup where Jesus sits down at the party to end all parties and says, finally, we can be together. The Apostle Paul, when he tries to explain how communion works, says, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Communion is meant to be future-focused, not just past-focused. We are meant to focus on the stuff that's held us back, on the stuff that limits us, but it's also meant to be this promise of this incredible future we're looking forward to. We together are invited into the life that Jesus has purchased for us. I might pray. Jesus, we begin this journey with you. We acknowledge we are so far from perfect. All of us have had moments this last week we're not proud of. All of us have fallen short. Thank you, though, that you call us to life. And you call us to life together with you. Jesus, in the times this coming week where we're tempted to treat you like a rabbi, like a teacher, who we can pick and choose what we like, can you remind us who you are? Holy Spirit, help us, help us know that Jesus is Lord. Save us from self-importance. Save us from getting busy about lots of good things things. Jesus, help us do the God thing with you. We know we can't do it alone. Help us bring, like Mary did, all that we have 
and lay it at your feet. Thank you that you brought all that you have and gave it to us. Thank you for the life you invite us into. Amen. We're going to stand and sing one last song.